my brother who was four years older than me and I at one year old, um, 16 months old. We waddled outside to play in our favorite sandbox, which we chose to be right next to my dad's rusty weight bench. And as my brother was steering the ship with the weight, and I was standing at the helm, standing next to the bench, the weight, the giant weight slipped off and the barbell tipped and I just happened to be in the right place the right time and was pinched between the bench and the weight. Um, as the EMTs were rushing me to the hospital in the ambulance, they really didn't think I was going to live. I was in shock, I wasn't making any sound, it was non-responsive. Um, when I got to the hospital, the Vietnam veteran doctor who saved my life, he said that it looked like I had been blown up by shrapnel. My insides had holes in them and, and it was pretty bad. And my spine was like squished toothpaste. They really didn't have a lot of hope for my recovery. They thought that I had probably had severe brain damage because I was still in shock. They didn't know how it, would, it affected my, my mind and they really didn't think that I would ever walk again. My parents were athletic, they loved the outdoors, they were passionate about life, they were avid water skiers, climbers, they, they loved hiking, camping, we would go on horseback rides, and they really expected me to do everything that my siblings did. They knew that life would be challenging for me, and so they, they really pushed me to figure it out, to adapt. And, you know, there's no manual for parents that raise children with disabilities. And, you know, they didn't tell me how to do this. They didn't tell me how to adapt. They just let me have the freedom and space to figure it out. You know, whatever we were doing, figure it out. And it was a really empowering and, and confidence-building experience for me to know that no matter what the situation is, I could figure out how to make it work for me. And later in life when I would, you know, spend time with friends and leave town or or leave the home, um, I, I knew I was going to be okay. I had the confidence to know that I could take care of myself no matter what. We didn't have a lot of money, so when I was 14, I sold raffle tickets door to door to raise enough money for me to be able to take adaptive ski lessons. And it was the best thing I ever did. I hated selling the raffle tickets at 14. It was terribly embarrassing, um, but so worth it. They kind of, you know, got me fit in this funny contraption, the sit ski that you saw up there. And then they just kind of let you go down this bunny hill by yourself. And, See if you can hold your balance. If you can't, you fall over. <laughs> um, I, I loved it. <laughs> it's, um, it, you know, it's kind of funny that I loved that moment, but it gave me the, the challenge and the confidence that maybe I could do this. You know, maybe I, maybe I have what it takes to do this. I fell every turn that first day, every turn. And in Monoski, you don't have the pizza wedge you know, that kids have, you know, the ability to like push your skis out and keep your balance and slow yourself down. No, in a mono ski, you have to learn how to turn. You have to learn how to turn. And I felt every single turn, wipe out, in the face, snow, covered in snow, soaking wet, went home so happy, so exhausted. At the end of the first season, somebody approached me and asked me if I wanted to ski race. And I was like, there's racing? Yeah, I'm all about that. <laughs> so I started doing like amateur state races, um, Idaho State Games, and um, did pretty well considering it, I was such a rookie beginner. Um, I won some medals because, you know, I did okay keeping my balance on ice. Um, and I loved it. I, when I got into high school, I joined the high school ski team and I, I had this great sense of belonging and surrounding something physical, something that I could relate to my peers with, 
that was this cool thing that took away from the whole charge about my disability. All of a sudden, it was a new conversation that I had with my peers. In a wheelchair, you're so confined. You have to go, you find it off sidewalk. You have to find a curb cut. You have to find the elevator. Where's the elevator? Where's the elevator? Um, where's the accessible bathroom? Anybody? Anybody? Um, you know, and you're always looking for these ways to get around and figure it out and and grass is terrible, it's so hard to get over, and sand, you get stuck in sand, your tiny wheels get stuck in sand, sand, and gravel socks, and you know, just all these little barriers. And in skiing it was like, ugh, oh, I could just go over anything. And it was so freeing, and I felt equal to the people next to me. We were all doing the same thing, getting from point A to point B in the funnest way possible, riding the same chairlift, and there was none of these funky, weird little barriers everywhere. So I loved that feeling, that rush of just the wind in my face and being out there in nature and not feeling confined. Music did that in, in a different way. Music did that for me. It gave me a voice. You know, so often, Growing up with a disability, I didn't feel like I had a voice, you know, especially as you grow up as a girl with a disability, you're, you're always a little girl, you know, people pat you on the head, you know, when you're 16, 17, it's like, I know I'm shorter than you, but I'm like a teenager and I think you're lame and I want to rebel against you. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, you know, there just was always this awkwardness about using my voice and speaking up and asserting myself. It was so scary. You know, I want, there's just kind of this love-hate relationship between me and the rest of the world. Of, I want you to accept me. I want you to feel like I'm normal so I can feel normal. And at the same time, you know, there's this, I hate where it's like, oh, why do you, you know, why can't I talk to you? I'm trying to be nice, you know, I'm trying to be good and all of this stuff. And I think a lot of teenagers feel that way. So music was my outlet to just let my voice flow out of me and not worry about what people think about this girl in a wheelchair and, and all of these stereotypes. Olympics were going to be in Salt Lake City, Utah, 2002. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's in my backyard. This is this is an amazing opportunity. Maybe I could do it. And so I just kind of picked up and left and moved to Utah and decided to give it a try, give it a shot, and see what happened. Oh my gosh, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Luckily, I didn't. I was a total amateur rookie. I didn't have my own equipment. I barely had a car. I barely had any money. And here I was like, yay, I'm going to do this. So easy. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I had to work so hard. I had two years to get ready for the Paralympics. Just to give you an idea of the level of competition, I worked out either in the gym or pushing up steep hills, or skiing 300 days of the year, both years before Paralympics. That was the level of, of dedication that I had to give to that, and every one of my competitors were doing the same thing. I was also going to school and working. I won my first gold medal in slalom at the World Cup in Canada. And then I got this knock on the door, and it was the head coach of the U.S. Adaptive Ski Team. <laughs> and he said, congratulations, you made the ski team. And I was elated, I was so excited, because that was the first major hurdle that I had to overcome in order to go to the Paralympics. Then I won three gold medals at nationals, and that's what sealed the deal for me to get on the C team for the Paralympics. When I crossed that first finish line, that was the moment I became a Paralympian for life. <laughs> the next two days, I just put everything on the line, just completely let go, and won two bronze medals, making me a Paralympic medalist. 
It was an incredible, incredible experience. And I thought, oh my gosh, I finally overcame my disability. I, I can just ignore it now. I'm like this champion, I'm so cool. Not so much. I realized coming home that everything was the same. I was back to the whole grind and the reality of life and um, you know, it just it, it just taken its toll on me. At 23 years old, after winning the World Cup overall, I had kidney disease and I was immediately put on dialysis. That was a pretty big blow to my ego. You know, my motto was, my whole motto in life was get off the couch. You know, I can do this, you know, come on, you can do it too. And that changed immediately. All of a sudden, I had this excuse and reason to rest. And I realized that it's not always about the go, go, go of life. That sometimes there is a time to rest, a time to meditate and contemplate. And I wrote a song about kind of wandering in that space and kind of the wandering in the wilderness and the desert. Just let it go. I have a vision for the world and for people with disabilities um, and that really came from my experience coaching. I wanted to not only just teach them and show them how to do the sport and activity really well, but I also wanted to teach them how to be their own best advocate. I was, clean, I was picking up my gear to leave the ski hill one day and this adorable little girl came skiing down the mountain and I, I said, hi, did you have so much fun today? And there was no response. And so I said to her, you must be so cold out here. And the instructor said, she can't hear you. I was like, okay. So I waved, I waved at her, okay, bye. And no response, and he said, she can't see you either. I was like, okay, well, can I just give her a little squeeze on her hand or you know, just let her know that I'm here? And he, and he said, she can't feel you. She's paralyzed. And, I, and it, it just took me back. And I, I asked him, well, how do you know she wants to do this? That was my first question. <laughs> Does she want to actually do this? And he said, you know, we don't know. Her parents bring her up here every season to give her as many experiences as she can have. And it just floored me. And I, I said, you know, is, is is she, you know, firing? You know, is, are things happening up in the mind? You know, can she understand things? And, you know, how do we communicate with her? He's like, we don't. And But we do know that her mind is firing to some extent. They've done tests. And, um, you know, there is something going on. There is firing going. And, and her heart beats, you know, and everything's functional. But I just, I it was unbelievable and I left the mountain that day and I could not stop thinking about her. This had, this had blown my whole idea uh, about the value of a human being being their production, their contribution to community. I called everybody I knew and I was like, can you believe this? Like, what would you do you know, if you were the parents and what would this be like and what, what are your ideas about life? And you know, you know, we have all these ideas that people need to be productive to be of value. You know, what is her value? And the next week, I met a boy. I didn't really meet him. I just, I encountered him. I had an experience with him, too, and he had the same disability. And again, I just couldn't believe it. And I'm contemplating all these things as I'm driving home, and I'm just, you know, kind of jibber-jabbering in my mind, and all of a sudden I realized that these children had a huge effect on me. They'd had this unbelievable effect on my life. 
and the, uh, an incredible effect on their parents and those instructors that took them down the mountain. And everybody that they encountered was affected by these children. And I realized that it's not about what we produce. It's not about what we uh, contribute. It's not about any of that. It's really about our effect on each other and on the world. What's my value if I never help you?